In this video, we're going to talk a bit about confidence intervals. Confidence intervals are one way we make inferences about quantities we care about. At the risk of providing a circular definition, let me give you the definition of confidence interval and then delve into what we mean by confidence. A confidence interval is a range of values that contains the true but unknown population statistic, for example, the mean, with a certain degree of confidence. Confidence is defined as the proportion of times that confidence intervals calculated for sample statistics will contain the true population value. Let's think back to our example from the last video, where we imagined being able to take a thousand samples of a thousand Canadians to survey their ages. From those, we would get a thousand sample means, and for each one, we could calculate a confidence interval. If we calculated a 95% confidence interval, roughly 95% of the thousand intervals would contain the true but unknown population parameter. The others would not. If instead we had calculated a 99% confidence interval, then 99% of the intervals would contain the true population quantity, and the others would not. The level that we pick is arbitrary. That is, we could pick anything between 0 and 100. However, there are strong conventions in political science specifically, and the social sciences in general, to use either 95%, 99%, or 99.9%, .9%, with 95% being the most common value. As we'll see below, the higher the confidence, the wider the interval. Thanks to the central limit theorem, we know that roughly 95% of all sample means, or samples of size n, will be in the interval mu plus or minus 1.96 times the standard error. Turning the idea around, if we know that 95% of sample means lie in this region, then it should be the case that for 95% of sample means, the true population value will be within 1.96 standard errors of the sample mean. Consider the following experiment. We flip a coin 50 times, getting either heads or tails each time. We calculate the proportion of heads by dividing the number of times we get heads by 50. And we calculate a confidence interval for this proportion. More details on how that would work exactly will come a bit later. We repeat this experiment 100 times, getting 100 confidence intervals. We know that the true proportion in the population is 0.5 because our hypothetical coin is fair. And we suspect that roughly five of the confidence intervals should not cover the true population value, and the other 95 should. This figure shows the results of that simulation. The intervals that exclude the truth are colored in blue. We count six of them. It is not surprising that the number isn't exactly five. After all, there's randomness involved here. We would be more surprised if the number were something like zero or 20. One thing to consider is this. We generally only ever have a single confidence interval. So how do we know we're in one of the orange intervals, that is one of the good ones that covers the true population value, rather than one of the blue ones that doesn't? The short answer is we don't know. By setting our confidence level high enough, it makes us willing to bet that we're in one of the good intervals. That's why we don't use confidence intervals of say 50%. In that case, we wouldn't be sufficiently confident that we're in one of the good intervals and not one of the bad ones. It's also worth noting that the confidence interval is not making a probability statement about the result. We are not saying that the true population value is in our single interval with probability 0.95. There is, in fact, a true state of the world. Either the true population value is in our interval with probability 1, or it's not in the interval, in which case the probability of being in it is zero. 
Just because we don't know which state we're in doesn't mean that the state of the world is probabilistic. We're not talking about quantum mechanics after all. I thought it would be worth talking about the confidence interval formulas for a minute. First, in the unlikely scenario where we know the population standard deviation of x, we could calculate the confidence interval as shown here. Note that z crit is the critical value of z that puts the appropriate probability in the tail. If we want a 95% confidence interval, we need 5% to be spread across both tails of the distribution. That means we need 2.5% in each one. To find, the probability, to find this in the probability table, look at page 249 in the book. We're looking for the entry in the area beyond z column that is 0 0.0250. We find this to be 1.96. So if you're using the standard normal distribution, we would use 1.96 as z crit. In the more likely situation, where we have to estimate the population standard deviation, we can do that with the sample standard deviation. Otherwise, the formula is the same. We can use this formula if we have relatively large samples. For small samples, we could use the t-statistic rather than the z-statistic. If our sample size was 60, we would look at the t-table on page 254 in the book for the row labeled 60 under the df column on the left-hand side of the table. We would follow it over to the column labeled 0 0.025, level of significance for one tail test, or 0 0.05, level of significance for two tail test. And we would find that the critical value of t is 2.00. The critical value multiplied by the standard error is called the margin of error. And it's worth noting that this formula doesn't require us to know the true population mean, which is nice. 